All right. This is InfoSec Decoded, number 61, Lasers and Blood, starting with Elizabeth, who has the blood. Yeah, so this story is kind of wild and kind of cool. These, uh, they've discovered that uh, uh, there's a way to make bricks in space. So, you know, we talk about col colonizing Mars and everything. Um, the problem is to build the colonies on Mars, you need some kind of building materials. And it's very expensive to ship building materials to Mars. Uh, uh, according to this article, $2 million to send a single brick uh, to Mars. So that's, that's going to be a pretty expensive um, building you're going to uh, create there. But there's, a, there's an answer for this. Um, ask, <laughs> it's easy. And, you know, someday in, uh, you know, 100 years, I guess we'll be seeing this on those um, home, home, uh, home craft shows. Uh, go ahead and make your own bricks using uh, dust from the red planet and blood, uh, astronaut blood. So um, they've made a, a concrete-like substance called astrocrete uh, using uh, human blood and uh, a synthetic stand-in for Mars dust. And they found out that it works even better if you pee in it too. So, uh, you know, so blood, sweat, blood, sweat, tears, and urine. So you can, you can build something literally from your own blood, sweat, and tears. And this is the life that Elon Musk wants for himself. Yeah, well, you know, I mean. Who could possibly deny the delight of that? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we could totally destroy Earth, go off into Mars, and yeah. build our... Um, build our new homes with our literal blood and tears. That's we can. That's one option, and that does oh, seem like the most oh. likely option. I like it. Doesn't look like we're going to actually do anything about global warming, so moving to Mars might be the most practical solution. Yeah, oh. uh, yeah. I mean, as soon as we, uh, as soon as uh, they also, um, you know, we've done this before in the past. Uh, Move to Mars. No, we used blood for bricks, but in the past we really? used ox blood. Yeah, according to this article, anyway. Oh, I, I, mean, I didn't know that. Isn't that what the Mayas, the Aztecs, and the Inca did? I thought Adobe was just mud. Is there blood in it? I mean, uh, it's red. <laughs> well, well, I, I really don't know. I thought it was just mud. So apparently, according to this article, ancient Chinese and Roman builders once used ox and pig blood to uh, strengthen the mortar in their building. And this is operating on the same principle. Well, uh, to be fair, uh, if you live in a, you know, if you do have a slaughterhouse, there really is an enormous amount of blood. It's a, a common resource. You might as well use it. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the one of the blurbs in this article that I found amusing was that uh, they tried several different uh, construction ideas using um, human byproducts on Mars, and uh, one of them was uh, using Mars dust, urine, feces, and blood to create slightly crappier versions of common metal. Uh -huh. But, yeah, I see what they did there. Uh, 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 um, apparently, slightly crappier versions of what? Of uh, common metal tools. Metal tools? Oh, yeah. great. So but there's uh, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, but before that, there was the Shit Age. Yeah, but apparently that was too disgusting, so they scrapped that plan. Oh, I wonder I why. They have to cut that out of that movie with Matt Damon. Like, uh, <laughs> <what's> the... <laughs> anyway. Yeah. They always have to make things more glamorous than they really are. All right. All right. Well, let's go on to Caitlin, who has Unicode with melting faces. Yeah. So I wanted to put the most important story up front first. Um, so Engadget has an article written by um, uh, I uh, Bonnie Fakik. I, I totally mispronounced that person's name. But anyway, uh, Unicode is uh, at version 14. And they added 37 new emojis. <laughs> and um, and let's see. So, oh, I guess, can I, we're not sharing screens. Um, yeah, you want to. Let me, uh, I, I can turn it on. Okay, you can do that. Yeah, go ahead. This is all important. 
important. It's really important. We have the technology. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So here's the here's the new um, the new uh, emojis coming out. So at the top left, we have like melty face, mm -hmm. and we have like shocked hand over mouth. We have like peeking salute, which I think is a really good one. I don't know why we don't have salute already. Um, mm -hmm. And um, another good one is the happy tears. Uh, we have some handshakes and, and pointy stuff, uh, which is which is always good. Uh, we have pregnant men and women. Um, we have oh a troll, a troll is going to be a good one to use online. Um, and then there's let's see nests beans, <laughs> um, um, and a weird Illuminati like symbol at the bottom left. I don't know what that is. It looks it's like the a... evil eye. It's the evil eye. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. So we have like evil symbols. Perfect. So anyway, new emoji. Cool. This is very it's actually important to everyone. Supposed to, it's actually supposed to ward off the evil eye. Oh, okay. Well, so it's supposed to be oh, a good oh, disco ball. I thought it was the earth being blown up, but it's a disco ball. Okay. Caitlin, it's I'm, not ex I'm not excited to see you. I'm not surprised to see you excited about the troll emoji. I would expect that. Yeah. I'm a little confused by like some of these like melty face and dashed line face. Uh, well, I wonder what those are for. Melty face apparently was very uh, requested. I, I don't know why. Um, I, I definitely like the, the heart hand emojis at the bottom left or middle left. Um, those are really good. Um, I kind of get the impression that the dashed uh, emoji is sort of like a ghost type emoji. But okay. there's already a ghost. Yeah, but not a ghost emoji face. <laughs> very important to have representation. I guess. Yeah. I like the low battery one. That one could be handy. Yeah, some of these I'm surprised aren't already on there, like low battery and an equal sign. Like I'm pretty sure Unicode has like plenty of equal yeah. signs in there. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, new Unicode. This is very important. So. And the fake vaccine card. Fake vaccine card. Yes. <laughs> That's an important one these days. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Well, all right. And then uh, we got Irvin with no more passwords. According to Microsoft, they have been talking about this for a while and uh, they're saying the future is here, uh, not using passwords, but instead use the Microsoft Authenticator app or Windows Hello or a security key or a ver verification phone or a ver verification code to your phone or email. Oh, well, that sounds a little better. I was wondering what happens if you lose your phone or something. Yeah, but it yeah. sounds like there are backups. Of course, now, how does your email secure it? If your email works, your email then has a password, or does your email run in the same system? So again, you're on the same system. Well, then there, I see a fundamental logical flaw here. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. this came out on Twitter, and some of the older InfoSec guys said, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. We're not going to live to see that. Getting rid of passwords is one of those things they promised for like 37 years, like Linux on the desktop. Well. Microsoft is trying their hand at this. To be fair, Microsoft has done this many times before. Like Microsoft made Microsoft login that was supposed to be the universal login like 15 years ago, back in the Obama administration, when Obama said the US government will be your password manager and we'll have official US government login and you'll log into everything through that. And like a lot of Obama's ideas, that one just landed with a thud and everyone stood there in stunned silence. And the next day he pretended he never said that. But Microsoft did try to do it. And again, nobody cared. We're going to make micro. Instead, they made Facebook, the company you trust, to log in for everything. Yeah, about that. Well, <laughs> they won. <laughs> they won. Yeah. This is Gresham's law. You know, bad money drives out good. Anyway, we'll see. Yeah, we will totally see how well or how easy it is to break this authenticator app and get around, circumvent all this. Yeah, this will be yeah. fun. It sounds pretty bogus to me, but I guess we're going to see. Yes. All right. So Alan suggests that there's something wrong with Amazon. What? <laughs> Believe it or not. Yes. <laughs> the Washington, D.C. attorney, uh, district attorney, has updated a lawsuit filed originally in May, I believe, alleging that Amazon engages in large scale anti competitive behavior. And um, it's surprising that this hasn't gotten more attention. Uh, in fact, I wasn't aware of the uh, initial filing, 
But what the uh, uh, district attorney alleges is that Amazon is manipulating third-party sellers on its platform to maintain artificially high prices, not only on Amazon, but on any other online platforms or marketplaces that they are selling on. And these prices can result in significantly uh, higher costs to the consumer. So the way it works is um, when a third party seller uh, opts to s uh, sign up for Amazon, they agree to a certain price floor. Um, well, technically it's called a marg minimum margin agreement and they guarantee that Amazon will get a certain cut this is what taxi margin. drivers have to do. Taxi drivers have to pay a certain amount of money. And if they don't do enough rides, they don't make a profit. Well, it's a little bit different in the taxi. The taxi market was heavily regulated. Um, like you had to get one of those, uh, those tags. Medallions, yeah. Medallions, yes, right. Uh, but here with Amazon, you know, this is a, a, a presumably largely unregulated um, competitive space, online retail. And yet what this agreement that uh, Amazon has in place does is it enforces a higher prices uh, because right. of these uh, guaranteed margins, these, according to the minimum margin agreement. And so what it means is that if the third party seller uh, reduces their prices, then Amazon is entitled to take a greater share in order to keep that margin. And likewise, if Amazon catches one of these third-party sellers selling at a lower price on a different platform, then Amazon once again is entitled to take a larger cut so that they can keep that, that margin. Mm. Uh, I am not an expert in anti-competitive practices, but you know, I'd say the smell test is perfectly valid on this one. Yeah, you know, the part that amazes me is the antitrust regulation like Elizabeth Warren's been trying to bring against the big tech giants was written primarily about price increases. And that's why companies like Google and Facebook, you can't really go after them because their product is free. This is the first time Amazon is doing something that plainly falls within the original rules of monopoly abuse. Yeah, and it seems to be very clear um, the the terms of the, I don't know how long the, these uh, these agreements have been in place, but the terms are just seem so egregious that it's surprising this hasn't become an issue sooner. So this reminds me of what Microsoft did, where they did get sued and almost broken up, where they would force companies to only put Windows on all the machines, and if you dared to sell a machine with Linux, they would deny you access to all Microsoft products, so you would go broke. Yeah, well, they might really suffer for that. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Anyway, all right. And then, uh, so I was amazed. I've been hearing about this, and it's come out. They now have human trials for the cancer vaccine based on the COVID vaccine. They said, you know, this was the giant leap forward in technology of vaccines. And they said cancer cells that grow in your body are different from healthy cells, and they do have a characteristic protein on the surface and they can train your immune system to attack the cancer cells. I've been hearing about this for 10 years, but I never saw the details and I had no idea they made it up to human trials, but they have. They're giving it to people with lung cancer now, which is bloody awesome. I'm very amazed. This sounds wonderful. I mean, so much better than our God awful cancer treatments now where we, you try to cut out the cancer and hit it with radiation and poison your whole body with chemotherapy that almost kills you. You know, cancer is awful. And getting your immune system to actually attack the cancer cells and not everything else seems like the real good way to do this. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy about that. Anyway, um, so Liz says, America, there's a problem with online security. Yeah, I know. Uh, and, and surprisingly enough, uh, a lot of uh, average Americans um, somehow think that their uh, information is not uh, secure online. I don't know where they would get this impression. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, it, this had a pretty interesting breakdown on uh, this uh, survey that was done. Um, and 
what what I thought was interesting that there were was that there were so many people who um, actually seem to think stuff is secure um, around uh, ten percent in each of these categories. So they uh, asked on three categories: social media activity physical location and private text conversations and uh, almost 10% in each category thought that those were extremely or very secure, which uh, I want to meet those people. Um, but uh, the vast, the majority in each, each category said, hey, you know, this is a problem. Maybe we should have some policy in place to protect us and our data um, because so many of us are getting our identity stolen. Now, uh, this happened to me years ago, and it happened just based off of uh, paper uh, fraud uh, for the most part because somebody had um, stolen my social security card uh, along with some other stuff and then used it to uh, used it to get a job at FedEx, <laughs> it turned out, uh, amongst other things. So it seems I seems relatively harmless. I mean, how does it hurt you? Uh, it hurt me. Uh, it hurt me in that uh, with regard to the IRS because there were some tax complications that came out, came up because of that. But uh, yeah. um, and some other less less funny things. But um, they did it with their own name too. They managed to do it with their own name, and it was a Chinese man. And I'm like, nobody is apparently checking these lists because that name isn't even close to mine. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think it's, you know, I think one of the things that was mentioned, you know, in this is that people don't have a whole lot of trust in the government to fix this. Uh, most people are looking more to the private sector versus the government, which seems like a fairly sound plan. However, the government is the only one who can act, only entity who can enact uh, policy change. And that's really the only thing that's gonna, that's really the only thing that's gonna incentivize meaningful change here because I have seen firsthand companies do not care about consumers. They really do not care. They know what's going on and they do not care. Uh, so you don't think our government cares? Our government only cares if the politicians are worried that their constituents are going to get so upset that they won't reelect them. So yeah, well, that's the whole idea. <laughs> Yep. But of course, the private companies are supposed to carry in so much of when people get so annoyed, they quit buying your junk. Like this is the thing about Facebook. Facebook keeps being exposed doing horrible things, but nobody ever actually leaves Facebook. So they don't no. care. No. If you actually started leaving Facebook, then they would care. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right. But anyway, uh, then Caitlin has uh, laser cannons, which laser is one cannons. of those crowd pleasers. You can never go wrong with laser cannons. You, you cannot. Uh, so the Daily Star, um, that's co.uk, uh, has an article written by uh, Sierra Daly uh, talking about how the UK military wants to put uh, laser cannons on their warships, which is a six billion euro uh, tech push, um, which yeah um so so this isn't necessarily new um back in what was it like 2019 um the ministry of defense uh, tried to give the contract uh, to a similar idea to create to put uh, laser cannons um on their you know trucks and tanks and warships uh but unfortunately uh the the company um had a lot of difficulty getting it produced because the lasers are, are directed by mirrors and these high powered lasers just melt the mirrors, <laughs> even though only like 0.001% of the power goes into the mirror and the rest gets reflected. That's still enough. These are high powered enough that mm -hmm. it just destroys whatever you put in there to, to melt it. So, um, uh, so yeah, so the, it looks like the, the UK military is just looking for tech companies to build these laser cannons, which is going to be the future of warfare, it looks like. The, the thing about laser cannons and the reason why, why they're so sought after, despite the fact that they are high tech and they're having difficulty putting them together, is because ammunition turns out to be very expensive. And if we get rid of ammunition and we just make everything electrical, 
um, it becomes much cheaper to shoot. You, you, it's it, it, it's not like um, in in Star Wars uh, they were shooting lasers at 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 ships. And um, I remember one of the one of the people were like, "Wait, hold your fire! There are you know we don't see any life signs on the ship." And but I mean they're shooting lasers. So if you really think about it, it's like why even bother <laughs> halting fire? You know, it's like what are you paying by the laser now? Uh, <laughs> You know, so it would be more environmental too. All that gunpowder creates carbon dioxide. Well, I'm sure heard, I'm sure that's the real reason. I'm, I yes. haven't heard people bring this up. We could have green <laughs> war. Green war, yes. That would be that would that that's the ultimate um um political uh, uh should, political speech for I know I should contact AOC and said replace the Green New Deal with Green War and then you'll get Republican support. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no, yeah, it's bipartisanship. Exactly. You know, I have so just, many of these brilliant ideas. Yes. Yeah. You package know, I, package your idea as like war and oppression, and yeah. suddenly, you know, you can get both sides on board. Yeah, I think it's probably not going to be that simple. But anyway, all right. So anyway, Irvin has comparing web browsers. So I put in this because uh just want to make aware that everybody has their opinions. On, on these things and don't just don't just take it at face value do your own research too because they this site did a bunch of tests and, and says that Chrome is the best uh, we kind of knew that already but then I, I like the one of the last lines of if privacy is your top priority keep looking <laughs> yeah well, that, well actually there um, I think Firefox has been pushing privacy stuff they've switched to HTTPS a do over H DNS over HTTPS, and some of them recently did something about the tracking cookies, right? Yes. I think that might have also been Firefox. So yes. technically, I would think Firefox might be best for your privacy, but I don't really know. Right, right. So it, it's just pointing out that there's a lot of these types of articles. Do your own research. Don't just don't just take these at face value because sometimes, sometimes. Well, I have like five web browsers just because I need them to store different things and stuff. Yeah. Okay. A more efficient, like multi tab, multi window system in a one browser would probably be better, but I just find it more convenient to use different browsers for different sites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, when you become a very advanced user, um, the differences between the browsers start to matter. Um, like when you're doing like web development, uh, you know, the like Firefox, I think, has, has slightly better development tools than Chrome. Yeah. Um, but for the average user, they're just visiting sites. They don't care. They just want something that works. And some of us write web pages that render equally poorly in all browsers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the things I, I learned early on in web development is always test your web page in every browser. Because if you are using like Chrome, your, your clients are going to be using Opera. If you use Opera, your clients are going to be using old Internet Explorer. I mean, you just have to. And, and they'll get upset that it didn't render correctly. It's like just yeah. all the browsers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. And Alan has Gartner. Yes. Another Gartner story. Um, they've conducted a survey of IT executives. And those IT executives have said that the number one adoption barrier to or barrier to adopting new technologies, IT related technologies, is talent shortages. And in fact, that, is, that accounts for 64% of the barriers to t new technology adoption. Um, this just has to do with the, the lack of talent that's available out there, at least in the eyes of IT executives. And of course, we can have a long conversation about how tech hiring is so problematic. But if nothing else, at least the IT executives recognize that um, a certain level of talent is necessary in order to adopt new technologies and in order to adopt those new technologies successfully. Um, so uh, other important findings from this, um, this, the surveys that 58% of their IT executive respondents plan to uh, increase emerging technology investment in 2021, and that's versus only 29% in 2020. 
So we are seeing a very rapid acceleration in the adoption of new technologies, much of which is driven by the remote work phenomenon. Also, probably with some major advancements in technology. So we're kind of entering into a new technology uh, cycle at this point. But at any rate, um, this does have a lot of potential for students or uh, new folks who are entering in the, into the industry and in IT industry. Um, there are a lot of possibilities in cloud and in cybersecurity. I think we're all seeing that. Our students get jobs like crazy. I mean, yeah. there's a, they're not kidding about the talent shortage. Yeah, yeah. And, Even in a yeah. tech hub like San Francisco, apparently there just aren't enough people. Uh, there certainly aren't. I mean, when I tried to hire people for a job, I couldn't find enough people. And the same with everybody. Yeah. That's why every student hack into our classes because you can totally get a job if you learn some tech. That's right. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to Gartner coming up with the magic quadrant for tech talent. You know, the old challengers, leaders, niche players, and visionaries yeah. quadrant that they use for evaluating products. Mm hmm. I'm going to identify myself as a niche player. No, I don't know. All right. Anyway, well, anyway, this one here, um, I Violet Blue has a fantastic pandemic roundup and she has amazing stuff. And this one caught my attention asking a question. I've tried to do some statistics on this myself. You wonder if Republicans are dying more of COVID than Democrats. And in fact, in like the first six months of the pandemic, it was the opposite. Democrats died more than Republicans because the first big outbreak was in New York City and New Jersey, which is an urban center and a blue center. And that made more Democrats were dying. It took a while for it to reach the urban, the, uh, the country uh, where the Republicans live. But after that, the Republican policies of deliberately encouraging the virus, which are just breathtaking, like not letting you wear masks, telling people not to take the vaccine, not letting people require the vaccine, have in fact taken effect to where now the number of uh, people in red states or red counties that are dying is seven times larger than in the bluest states. And so, and it's very clearly a deliberate action of the right-wing ecosystem, like the Fox News people are all vaccinated and everybody at Fox News has to now be tested every day if they aren't vaccinated. So they're more strict than anything Biden passed, but they promote anti-vax and fake medicine and stuff. And so they did an actuarial analysis. He said, well, why does this work? I mean, the first thought a lot of us had is, why would they kill off their own voters? And he said, the answer is to make Biden fail. And he said, if you do an actuarial analysis, like the military might, of is it worth sacrificing a number of our own people we're killing in order to make Biden fail to win? And they say it does offer a net benefit. And this is the kind of cold-hearted actuarial analysis that you do uh, when, you, when they decide, you know, we will not bother to put anti-lock brakes on the cars, and that will only kill like 200 people a year. And those people only will sue us for like $200,000 a year. And that's cheaper than what it would cost to put the anti-lock brakes in the car. So why bother? It's the same kind of logic. So anyways, um, the raw data is very impressive, showing that as expected, here's the COVID-19 death rate distribution in from July to September. And it's 27.7 in the reddest state, but only 3.7 in the bluest state. It's really amazing. And you know, as we've seen a very small number of Republicans have actually come out publicly saying you guys should really take the vaccine, but they've created such a, a momentum of lying and denying the vaccine that people won't listen to it. Now they booed Trump. Trump tried telling them take the vaccine and they'll boo. They're not going to do it. You know, they've made a monster they can't stop. But um, the real plotters like Steve Bannon that plan all this stuff have probably made a logical decision that the number of people they're killing is worth it for the political benefit they gain. Anyway, um, I thought that was it. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds almost like we're already in a civil war if people are dying to, you know, oppose, um, you know, the, the Democrats. There's no gunfire. Well, not yet, but it, we're not far from it. There was some gunfire on January 6th. One person killed, that Ashley woman. And um, this is the question. And I think Steve Bannon reminds me of um, Charles Manson. He wants to ignite a race war in America, which is what Charles Manson wanted to do. There are a lot of people who believe that we should have a race war. That would be great. 
and uh, we should have the civil war again, the South against the North. They're trying to create it, and the Republicans are all jumping on board with it, Republican leaders. This is why the people I like now are the people who left the Republican Party. They make the most sense of anybody. The people who actually had principles have all left the Republican Party, with a couple exceptions, and all the people left are just there for power. They're complete hypocrites. In private, they admit they hate Trump and they take the vaccine, but in public, they say whatever sells, and they're cheerfully um, encouraging the destruction of the country. And you know, I was talking to my students about this last night. I think this comes from Russian disinformation. This is our divide, and the Russians manipulate us into fighting more over it. But anyway, we're living through exciting times, and I do not see how it's going to be resolved. Well, Supposedly, was, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and so we, we, we mentioned guns, but biological warfare is absolutely a thing that, that has been employed. And this seems like the, the first example I've ever heard of, of uh, biological warfare suicide bomb, or, you know, yeah. suicides, I should say, just not bombings, but. Well, this is actually something long in military tradition. Napoleon did this, where you encourage your own soldiers to sacrifice themselves to benefit your thing. They, um, so I mean, it, but it's you're right. It's biological warfare being used for political advantage, even though you sacrifice more of your own people to do it. Which is uh, a a it can be a winning chess move, and it may well win. I mean, like I say, I I think the Republicans are going to pull ahead in 22, and they may very well win in 24. This might work for them, but we will see. We are living through a fascinating sociological experiment. Anyway, so Liz has someone picking on Facebook. Well, uh, yeah, so Facebook uh, apparently did a bunch of research over the past few years on its users that they kept secret because uh, the results of this research weren't too favorable. Um, and, and what this reminds me of is, uh, you know, I used to read about how uh, doctors would prescribe people um, cigarettes back in the 50s and 60s to, to help them relax, like, uh, you know, go, go smoke some cigarettes and you'll feel better. Uh, have have a have a couple glasses of whiskey. There was this world. famous there was this famous ad of the baby holding a pack of cigarettes. Mom, before you yell at me, smoke a camel. Wow, yeah, that kind of thing. Where uh, you know the the companies produce their own research on uh, on just how helpful um, these horrible things can be. So Facebook did research on the way that uh, that. Um, uh, things like Instagram and Facebook and other social media affect teenagers and the results were not good. Uh, you know, they, uh, and they don't dispute any of this. Uh, and th these were part of, so this is a direct quote from one of their own internal presentation slides. We make body image issues worse for one in three teenage girls, like it's an accomplishment. And, you know, I mean, just to just to put a quick pause and, and say right there, yeah, it is an accomplishment because that means they can sell more shit to those uh, insecure teenage girls. Um, well, they're pulling out Instagram for kids. Yes, yes. Uh, it's just another... like the tobacco company pushing flavored tobacco and the booze industry making wine coolers to push these things to kids. Absolutely, yes, that is exactly. You couldn't have a better metaphor for it. Um, another one of their internal slides said that uh, teenagers blamed Instagram for increased levels of anxiety and depression. Um, 32% uh, of teenage girls said that they felt bad about their bodies. Uh, when they feel bad about their bodies, Instagram makes them feel even worse, which is great because we can sell those kids more stuff to make them feel better. Yep. Um, and uh, this one was pretty sobering for me. 13% uh, of UK teens and 6% of US uh, teens uh, traced a desire to kill themselves to Instagram. Um, and stuff like this. Now, now, uh, of course, you know, when asked about these things, they say, oh, well, you know, our stuff's not that bad. It's fine. Uh, 
I'm interested, but uh, you know, I think this this is this doesn't really say much about the way that we affect teen users' mental health. You know, let's not jump to conclusions here. Yeah, uh, that's their that's their you know external messaging, but um, you know, th this is the very business model: make people insecure so you can sell them stuff. And the earlier they can get them in the cycle, the better, because the more stuff they can sell them throughout the well, course. That goes of time. back to the fifties with uh, feminine beauty products and yep. hygiene products to yep. convince you that there's something wrong with you and you need to buy this stuff to fix it. Yep, exactly, and it's the it's that same classic trope just uh, expressed in a brand new digital medium. Yeah, and there's another one I was talking to Caitlin about last week where, where there's a study I heard that said that the average American woman between 15 and 25 spends five to 10 hours a week taking selfies. Wow. And uh, many people with teenage kids tell me this is true. They really do. And I think that's the point. I mean, they, it's a big, big deal to get pictures of you up on Instagram. Your friends look at your pictures and stuff. And then, of course you of course feel bad because I was talking to class about this last week. Of course, there was somebody prettier than you, stronger than you, richer than you, smarter than you. You're not the world's best. So you can feel bad about that if you want to, but it's not getting anywhere. It's not and I, getting just, anywhere good. I really can't imagine. I'm so glad this wasn't around when I was growing up. I can't imagine going through those kind of awkward teen, ugly duckling years where you're like growing into your, your body and yourself, uh, having all of that under the scrutiny of, of uh, social media like that. I can only imagine it makes things so much worse. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, anyway. Plus it's there for posterity. <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> Yep. So Facebook knows they're killing the teenagers and they just don't care. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than they don't care. It's uh, that's great because then they can use that. They can leverage that to sell them more stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, that's capitalism. All right. And then uh, let's see. I'm losing my mind. Uh, it must be on to the last one. Okay. So we're down to, oh my God. Oh my God, yes. Like totally, oh my God. Uh, there's a exploit out for, oh my God, on GitHub, uh, which is our last right. So, okay, so what's, oh my God, what am I talking about? What, what's going on here? Uh, so, oh my God uh, is a CVE, uh, CVE 2021-38-647. Okay, so what is, what's all this about? So. This has to do with OMI. OMI is on Azure, and it's essentially WMI for Linux. So for those that aren't aware what WMI is, it's the Windows Management Interface. Uh, basically, you can like query systems, figure out what's running on them, you know, just sort of manage it from, from afar or locally, and just you know, get information about a system. Um, it's, it, attackers often use WMI to Get information about you know what the system is doing, the network it's on, that kind of stuff. To, um, anyway, so there's a bug in the Linux version of this, the OMI, uh, where essentially what you do is you run. Let's see, what's the command? It's like execute, um, um, uh, execute shell command. So you you can send it essentially a, a SOAP request, which is like a web request called the execute shell command. And if you don't put in any credentials it runs it as root <laughs> yep. so oh my god <laughs> this is bad like totally bad and now there's a uh, a proof of concept on github where you can run it yourself and apparently like microsoft's having a terrible time getting rid of this on azure they're just basically saying we're not going to pass it for you you got to do it yourself so there's all these azure systems where you can basically take them over if you just send them a um a request to run your code. And Microsoft puts it on your Azure Linux server without telling you. Yes. Yeah. It's on all the Azure Linux systems. It's, yep. Well, if you turn on some features like monitoring, they do it by putting on an agent, which they don't tell you. And then you're supposed to know you need to update that agent when you don't even know it's there. Exactly. Well, you know, who would have thought that Microsoft doesn't know how to secure Linux? You know, what an idea. 
you know, it's really funny because Linux is becoming one of Microsoft's biggest products now. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you I know, did. and the, the other thing I saw too is that uh, malware authors are now starting to write malware specifically designed to run in Windows subsystem for Linux. So you have these like Linux executables running on, on Windows to like get around malware detection and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've been writing malware like that actually. And I've been running it in Azure for yeah. my instant response training. So I've written a bunch of new malware. I got some fun stuff. Oh, excellent. You, you can use PowerShell to turn off Windows Defender and then you can unzip malware that you moved in with password protected zip files. It's awesome. Yes. Oh yeah. No, PowerShell is, is absolutely amazing. I just, yeah, yeah, wrote a PowerShell script, uh, script recently to um, execute any, like get a command prompt on a user system uh, without their like knowledge and run it as admin and bypass UIC. Oh, Power, PowerShell is just fantastic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. And then Irvin has got uh, Tesla. Um, this was quite the read. This is the whole right to repair. Uh, we'll make Kirk that? happy. Kirk wanted us to cover right to repair today, and it's happening. Anyway. Well, there you go. Because uh, in this specific one, Tesla wanted $22,500 to fix a battery, but a repair shop could do it for five. Those Which both seem like really high numbers. How can it cost $5,000 to get a battery? I, what kind of battery? Car, car batteries are really expensive, to be honest. Well, Not my car battery, but of course, my car battery is from 1997. I mean, <laughs> well, no, no, electric car battery where you have to, where they're like lithium ion batteries and okay. they have to deliver uh, a lot of thousands of dollars for a battery. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, either way, that's that's a lot of money, but even more so because Tesla is basically saying you have to come to us. Right. You have to come to us to fix it. And this is just one in the long string of things just like Apple and John Deere and so many others who are taking this on. Of You have to come back to us and pay an exorbitant amount of money just to do something that a shop could do for much, much less. Or you could do it yourself. So is Maybe. it illegal to get it done at a third party shop or does it just void your warranty? It voids your warranty for now. The crazy thing is, when I first saw this um, last night, I was going to say, like, Irvin, well, he already covered this story, but it's a totally different story on the same topic because this is happening all over the country. Over the country and, and spanning multiple industries. It's not just tech. Right. You know, now, when, you know, when I learned this stuff like 50 years ago, you could take your car to the dealer and they would always overcharge you, but some people wanted like the genuine parts, or you could go to the knockoff place and get it done for one quarter of the price. And you had both options, you know? Right, but they're trying to take out that second option. But how can they? By making life miserable, like like removing the warranty. Right now, where do you go to fix a Tesla? Uh, I don't know of, of a, like my, I don't think Midas can fix it. I don't think they have the, the stuff to fix it. Well, I, I think it's just a matter of entrepreneurs. Some one of our students well, could open like an unauthorized Tesla knockoff repair shop and make money. Well, I, the, the way that, that they do this is first they say that your warranty is going to be void if you go to a third party. So you're already like saying, you know, if something happens to your car and you do need to take it to, to Tesla, like we're not going to do anything for you anymore, which is, you know, making these sort of agreement incentives not to do it. But also... <laughs> Um, in the case of like Apple, and I'm sure Tesla as well, they specifically make the parts very difficult to repair or replace. For example, in the newest iPhone, let's say you break your camera. You cannot take a camera from another iPhone 13 or another iPhone 12 and put it in yours uh, because each part is digitally signed to work only in your device. Oh. And which is, you know, they just do things like that to, to make it just very difficult to repair, do your own repairs. So you have to go through them. Um, and and it is it is a racket. I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, if you go through us, we'll spend seven thousand dollars. But uh, and you'll get the genuine parts versus, you know, five thousand dollars for like a cheap version of it. But as 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 Irvin mentioned, we're talking about like three, four times as much to go through the official dealership, which is, you know, of course, overcharging you. And they see this as a way to make make a lot more profit. Well, that sounds like something that probably violates antitrust regulations. Maybe they could do something about that. I mean, the part where they void your warranty, I think that's legal. 
But the part where they sabotage the parts to make it hard to repair for no good reason, that sounds like abuse of monopoly power to me. Well, unfortunately, under the law currently, it's not, um, which is where the whole right to repair thing is coming up. And, and like I said, Apple's been doing this for a while. Tesla has been doing this. Um, and John Deere is, of course, very famous for doing this as well, just making parts specifically designed not to be repairable by anyone other than the manufacturer. And HP made their printer cartridges like this. Yes, HP. Uh, yeah, they, so they put like DRM on specific um, parts so you can't use like a third party uh, and oh, K cups as well. That was a, that was a one that was interesting. The coffee cups, they actually tried to put DRM so you couldn't get like a third party coffee manufacturer. I mean, it's all over the place, and it, it really doesn't yeah. to stop. Yeah, pretty gruesome. Well, you know, I sort of like uh, like no starch press. They say no DRM. You get the PDF. You can share it if you want, because we're not like idiots, you know. <laughs> yeah. And they actually pay the authors. You know, that, that guy's always after me to write a book. You know, if they finally fire me at the college, maybe I'll write a book for those guys because they're definitely the best place to publish a tech book. Anyway. All right. So then uh, Alan has got to people not encrypting their email, which is certainly true. I remember Hillary Clinton, people screaming, she didn't encrypt her email. <laughs> Nobody encrypts their emails, as it turns out. Yeah. Uh, email encryption technology has been around a long time, 30 years and a very little research has gone into actually quantifying how much encryption is happening. Uh, according to this study, which looks at only users at uh, Leibniz University Hanover in Germany, the answer is only five and a half percent of users have encrypted their emails using uh, PGP or SMIME. Well, you know, about three years ago, the people that invented PGP admitted that they don't use it either. This sucks. <laughs> yeah. So it's just too cumbersome. Yeah. And it's too much of a hassle to use. And even in a population such as the university, with a lot of very technically adept or advanced users, nobody's bothering to use it, really. You know, this used to be a standard in my CISSP class. I would make all the students get PGP working, and they suffered so much. By, after 15 weeks, there were someone that still couldn't get it to work. It is really messed up. None so of the you products just abandon were. It? <laughs> I did quit assigning it. I said, you know, <laughs> yeah. I thought this is something you had to do to be a security professional, but I think we've all figured out that even the professionals don't use this horrible Even stuff. the professionals don't bother with it. That's right. <laughs> yes. And I, I think um, instead, People have used Proton Mail, but as we've learned recently, even Proton Mail isn't all that secure necessarily. If the Swiss government wants to uh, wants to subpoena the email, so there isn't really much you can do to keep your communication secure, other than being one of these these uh, privacy paranoid types and using SMIME or PGP. Well, you know the the military jobs I have. They use basically an air gap. You have to use the official company laptop. You can't even like put in a USB stick or anything to take anything off it. You have to go through the official company VPN. And then they use like Outlook or something. And everything is like trapped in their VPN little network. Seems like a, a really long workaround to uh, just encrypting. I suppose it's not just emails, but uh, all the other communications. Still. Well, yeah, but I mean, the point is, um, you wouldn't want to send company email to anybody's personal device anyway, because then they'll like put it in the cloud and lose it. So you basically want to keep everything inside your perimeter. I see. Yeah, I see. And that's why I think one of the huge products though, that the, the uh, former CTO of Mandiant or something, he gave a talk um, and he said that... Uh, he would like to hire people right away if they know how to put desktops in Azure so people can remote into those desktops. That's what we really want to do. So people, so the company data is never on your home device. You just open like an RDP session to an Azure cloud machine. And that's what you use. Yeah, there's been that's, a lot of talk about that. That's what another of my corporate jobs is doing. That seems, I would probably go for that. That makes sense. I don't want any of this information ever being on anybody's phone or home device at all. Just leave it in the cloud under the control of our administrators. Anyway. All right. So, yeah, uh, uh, so I'm pretty sure the military uses SMIME and a few other places. Um, PGP, I think, 
is relegated to nerds and reporters, but uh, S MIME is, is still pretty popular in areas where encrypted email is expected and off and Outlook supports it very well. Uh, you just push the encrypt button. Uh, but the problem with S MIME, the way I've seen it implemented is that it's really only useful within a domain. Right. So. And, and by the way, most email is in fact encrypted in transit with TLS connections. The problem is you don't really know if every hop was encrypted. Anyway, and so uh, the last one is the, the news last night that amazed me. I mean, these gymnasts testified before Congress and then they interviewed a woman who was from like um, a lawyer for like Indian, last Indian representatives. And apparently it has been a known fact for 20 years that if you go to the FBI with a case of child molestation, that it, they will just ignore it, throw it away, lie to you, tell you to just shut up and stop complaining. You're just making it up and do nothing. And apparently it's about the same as women who get raped, because this has been known for more than 20 years in America. If you're a woman that gets raped or molested and you go tell the cops, they will just do nothing. They Until recently, they would just tell you nothing's wrong, just shut up. Then they'll take like a rape kit and never analyze it, like the five or 7,000 just sitting in Texas that haven't even been run. Because the fact is that the chance of a prosecution occurring at the end is not worth it. So they just say, oh, it's not worth my time here. It's just your naming it. We're ready against them. So maybe there'll be a shakeup at the FBI because they totally lied to these women and said they're investigating it and then did nothing and didn't even report it to their superiors like they were supposed to. And they say this has sort of been an open secret in the business that each agent can choose which case to pursue. And they just don't bother with physical sexual molestation cases because they know they're going anywhere. They only want to do digital computer crime like child pornography because then you have evidence or something. So anyway, it's pretty shocking. And apparently there's going to be uh, hopefully a real shakeup at the FBI because this is, I think, the latest uh, battle in the Me Too war of women saying, you know, we're finally tired of having to put up with all this abuse and having the law totally do nothing. So I was pretty stunned by that. And I hope uh, we see some big shakeups. And they asked the interview Christopher Ray, and he had nothing but meaningless platitudes like, oh, gee, we're sorry, and we'll do better like Mark Zuckerberg, which is, I think that's not going to cut it this time. Anyway, uh, that's the last one. So I guess that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Tuesday.